evening, everyone. It's an immense pleasure to have you all with us as part of the launch of Vocademy, a great initiative of women in technology. I'm Serena Singh, a professional who's been with the financial services industry for over 27 years, and now a mentor, coach, and a social entrepreneur, and co-leading the Vocademy initiative of WIT. And with this, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Just Kiran, to take this forward. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Just Kiran. I've uh, been a training professional now for over two decades, currently working with uh, WIT India and trying to establish a robust Vocademy for all the women professionals out there. So some of you must be wondering, what is Vocademy and why do you need a Vocademy? Women are unique, women are special, and so are our needs to learn. We learn differently. We need um, special attention when it comes to the various stages of our lives and challenges that we meet. And Vocademy is our effort to make sure that the learning never stops for all women professionals there. Serena? And uh, just you said it very, very uh, well, uh, women are different. There, have, there has always been a deep rooted issue of women needing support and needing solutions that are dynamic and agile in tune with what are the challenges that we face on a day-to-day -day basis. And that is the reason that we have Vocademy because as Vocademy, we understand the uniqueness of those challenges. And just if you could share with us, how are we going to go about Vocademy and what all is it going to entail? Vocademy is a capability academy designed specifically for women, keeping in mind the various skills and expertise that they might require in the various roles that they would have in the professional world out there. Um, the courses on Vocademy are uh, spread across the entire ecosystem of training. When I say that, you will have courses on soft skills, on functional skills, and on technical skills. And unlike any other platform, Vocademy will have all these expertise available under one roof. So you would no longer have to go to multiple sites, multiple partners, multiple sources to, to, to fulfill all your needs. Vocademy will, un, will have an answer for all your needs there. So that's how Vocademy has been designed differently. So absolutely, Vocademy is unique. Programs designed by the women, for the women, and it's going to be a world of the women. And it would have uh, programs uh, not only for the the current roles that a woman might uh, 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 hold, but would also make sure that you have enough uh, learning opportunities for you to grow into a future leader. So we are ready to leap ahead with solutions for women development, skilling, upskilling, and reskilling. Uh, and we have ensured that these are customized, practical, real, and sustainable. So here we go. The uniqueness of Vocademy is also in the learning tracks that it offers. Um, the learning tracks that we offer are, are on return payment. So if, you're a, if, you're, if you had to leave uh, your corporate career for some reason, maybe because of maternity, maybe because of marriage, maybe because of secondment and you have to come back. So you will have a specialized track where you can reacquire the skills which you need to be able to get back into an active workforce. It would have uh, tracks for early career. It will have tracks for future leaders. So Vocademy will offer multiple options for women who really want to make big in the corporate world today. So with that, we'd like you to be very closely associated with this initiative phase where you get to unlearn, relearn, upskill, reskill yourself uh, to align with the external environment and the culture within organizations that is changing much more rapidly than before. So we are ready for this. And thank you very much for being with us as part of this initiative. Thank you. Time for our next panel discussion. And the topic for this discussion is Vocademy. To talk on this topic, we've got Mr. Nishche Suri. Mr. Suri is the president, Asia Pacific, Middle East and Africa at EdCast. With over two decades of experience in consulting in academia, he has worked with a wide array of clients in 25 countries across Asia and Middle East. Prior to EdCast, Nishche was a senior partner with KPMG in India. Along with Mr. Suri, we've got Kiti. Kiti leads the Future Skills Initiative at NASCOM, the industry association 
for the Indian IT industry. A business leader with 30 years of experience in her last avatar in the corporate world, she was a CEO of the joint venture between Genpak and NIIT called NIIT Unicorp, a training organization focused on the IT, ITES sector. The next person on the panel is Mr. Nikhil Barishikar. For the better part of the decade, Nikhil has been at the helm of Immaticus Learning's meteoric rise in the edutech sector. Assuming the responsibilities of the co-founder and the managing director of the Tech-Driven Professional Education Institute. This session is moderated by Ms. Serena Singh. Good evening, everyone. It is an immense pleasure for me to get you all into this um, very exciting session, which is the launch of Vocademy. And for me particularly, it is delightful that we have today with us Nikhil Barshikar from Imarticus, Kirti Seth from NASCOM, and Nishche Suri from Etcast to join in discussing this, particularly about the upskilling and training for women as we move ahead into a very, very uh, dynamic, unpredictable, and I would think a very fast-paced future, especially given what's happened in the last few months. Uh, just a couple of details that I thought I'll share with, uh, with you know, all our uh, participants and uh, you know, whoever's viewing us and listening to us. We know that women hold about 56% of university degrees overall, but only 36% of STEM degrees. And they make up only 25% of the STEM workforce. 60% of the women who take technical examinations actually fail them. And that was shocking when I got into the details and tried to understand that. We also know that the IMF projects that 11% of jobs currently held by women are at risk of elimination as a result of digital technologies and a higher percentage than, this is a higher percentage than for jobs held by men. So all this data and lots more, which I'm sure all of you are also as aware of, have made us think that there needs to be a different approach that needs to be followed towards women's skilling, keeping in mind their unique needs. In line with that, we will be announcing the launch of Vocademy right before the panel discussion with you WIT Academy is a capability academy that focuses on women's skilling in the fields of technical, functional, and soft skills training. It will help women acquire skills needed by them for their current and future roles through the means of specially designed learning tracks. The uniqueness about Academy is that it's a program which is for women, designed by women, with, of course, inputs from a lot of experts and industry uh, specialists. So we are very, very hopeful that this will really be something that will be very, very critical for women as they move into the future in areas of STEM. With that, I'm going to open up this panel discussion. Um, and once again, welcome Nishche, Nikhil, and Kirti. Um, I will address certain questions to each of you, but absolutely, if any of you would like to you know, opine on any of the other aspects, please do feel free to jump in. My first question is for you, Kirti, if I may. The key categories of online learning today are primary and secondary supplemental education, higher education, trust preparation, reskilling, and online certificate market and casual learning. Of all these, reskilling and online certification has seen the highest online adaptation and is a mature market today. What future trends do you see in this space that will drive growth? Thanks, Serena. Um, I don't know what it means when you say a mature market today. Uh, mature in lots of offerings out there. Uh, the question still remains how many people are actually learning them, completing them, and getting done with them. But the one good thing that's happened is, uh, if I may be so bold as to say, is this pandemic, where suddenly online learning just exploded. And I think that's really probably where this conversation has become so top, topical because everyone's talking about it. I mean, people I never thought would take a course are now learning something or the other. Sitting at home, people thought they'll do something. So one of the biggest barriers has, I think, come crumbling down, which is acceptance. So people have figured that it's really not so bad and there's some great stuff out there. 
So this is something that this genie will not go back in the bot- bottle because it's just too convenient, whether you want to do it on your own or you want to do it with someone coaching you or helping you. So online learning really has come of age and, and that's one of the things we can thank this pandemic for. But the other thing which has been coming, uh, ha- has been happening over the years, which is the way technology has changed, not just in what people need to learn, but how we can use technology for learning. And lots of things in India. I mean, I talk about India because we're in India and I'm sure the Academy is focused on Indian women as well. And as we go further into the conversation, there's a lot about our own cultural milieu that affects what's happening to women today. So technology has made learning also great. It's great fun. I mean, children are learning online today. How do would we have kept them engaged if we didn't have all the cool stuff that's available? And this cool stuff will just get cooler. Um, bandwidth has become cheaper, making video content is easier, tools have become available, so people are creating all kinds of content and making it really interesting. So immersive technology will soon start getting to be used for, for learning. Um, hands-on already, people ask the question, does this course have hands-on learning? Hands-on learning will be par, par for the course in any learning program. Uh, so that biggest bugbear that people had, that online learning is, oh, it's very passive, but what will people be able to do? They'll be able to do a heck of a lot. Um, high stakes exams, that's the other thing I think that's going to become uh, very credible today. The, the, the government also didn't allow it. There were policies against high stakes exams being held online, but the pandemic has changed all that. The new education policy in India is amazing. I think that from, from, a, from a standpoint of promoting online learning, I mean, if you haven't, if people on this uh, panel have not read this document, they really must. It's such a forward-looking document. Putting, putting technology center stage, not only to teach, but also on how to administer learning. Biggest one of all is the focus on teacher training. Because as learners, we have not been used to online learning. We don't know how to go about it. We don't know how to do it ourselves because our teachers never knew, but the teachers have been forced to learn. And now there are just courses, uh, the, the education policy talks about it. Um, I lead the Future Skills Initiative at NASCOM. We have a quota in our program to train teachers. So when you see these fundamental shifts, you see technology becoming center stage to anything that is being taught, whether it is online, whether it is blended, or whether it is even being taught in colleges. So I see joint degree programs coming up with training providers. So much beautiful content is out there. I think that's one biggest thing that's happening. Quality of content is amazing now. So why reinvent the wheel? Use something people already have. So these collaborations will be another great trend as we go forward and they're already there. I mean, Nishcha is my partner in crime on uh, on future skills and uh, it's an exciting world of collaboration, curation, small bite-sized learning, short generalist courses. I mean, it's a, it's this one, I would say one industry that has really bloomed uh, over the last six months. So exciting times for online reskilling and upskilling. Super, and you know, I think Cool stuff is really what uh, may resonate with a lot of people who are uh, viewing this. Um, you know, it's a generation of uh, uh, adapting much faster and much quicker to so many things that are happening. And, uh, you know, again, uh, uh, you know, bringing us to Nishche and, and just the part about collaboration. I think uh, what you've made is a very, very important point, Kirti. The fact is that there's technology on one side and then there's all the ways that you could take it to the people who need to, you know, take it, the consumers of, of that technology. Uh, and you're right, you know, sometimes we would think, oh, e-learning, online, how boring could that be? And now with so many tools and the kind of, um, you know, newer uh, things that we have available, the cooler stuff, I think it's just become a very, very exciting arena. So I think everyone's going to really look forward to that. With that, let me just uh, move, over to, move over to you, Nishche, for a quick uh, question on what you feel in terms of, you know, in the age of, TikTok, YouTube, Netflix, uh, the user or the learner is always connected and has access to various sources of information. Um, How does this impact the strategy and the skilling offerings of education technology or edtech organizations? 
Thanks, Serena. You know, the future of learning and development uh, lies at the intersection of uh, different worlds. Uh, human psychology, rapid digital adoption, and development impact. And in my mind, uh, clearly for this to come, come together in a meaningful way for the learner, there are three key words, just in time, just enough, and just for me. And the three golden words of learning are about relevance, application, and impact. Now, it's easier said than done. You know, technology definitely has played its part in both accelerating digital adoption. Uh, the pandemic has also accentuated the problem in many ways. The choices are many in terms of technology options. And the community, I guess, is still uh, becoming well-versed with what choice is the best choice for them in regard of disseminating this knowledge in a, in a scalable, uh, agile, sustainable way. Uh, there is a lot of content and there is a lot of quality content. I believe that there was always a lot of quality content. It's just added uh, to the number in terms of volume and the variety, of course. Uh, the question is of discovery. How do I actually um, discover meaningful information for me as a learner in time and anywhere? So mobile first, definitely needs to be a uh, platform that it gives you great analytics to be able to recognize learner behaviors and behavioral patterns in terms of consumption of content. And equally so, you need to have uh, an agile system that continues to reconfigure and adjust itself, given that uh, you know, skills are and ought to change at the speed of business because uh, clearly businesses are transforming and changing very rapidly. Now for ed tech organizations, therefore, you need a system of software that are conversational in nature that provide unified discovery of this content in an anytime, anywhere uh, format. And uh, clearly we're just you know, scratching the surface as of now because the adoption of learning experience platforms is still a fraction. And Edcast introduced as a pioneer in the, in the learning experience platform space. And we work with Fortune 500 and G2000 companies. We're working with academia, with government, uh, with small, smaller enterprises as well. Uh, to be able to address this problem of, of unified discovery and fulfilling the need for relevance, which is contextual to me, personalized, in time, through a mobile or through the web. Equally so, I think I just want to call this out, is learning in the flow of work. Now, collaboration tools, we've seen that, you know, the research suggests that uh, an employee or a learner or a user, in fact, is using some form of collaboration productivity tool six times in a minute. Six times. Now, that's hell of a lot. And if we can make learning available in these productivity tools, be it Salesforce or be it um, any, any, you know, Slack or Teams, uh, clearly there is an advantage there because then learning becomes in the flow of work, which individuals are anywhere performing. And it just ensures that that learning is then applied, which is the second golden word, and creates the impact. And the impact is at three levels organizationally, so you could see commercial gain at the organizational level. You could see it in terms of teams and units where there is better cohesion and adoption of process and product. And at the third level where individuals actually perform a lot better, which is what learning is meant to do, increase performance. Well, so, you know, the two words that I uh, normally associated with the new age of learning are unlearn and relearn. Right? And through all these um, kind of channels now available, I think that becomes a lot more easier. Um, Nikhil, my next question is for you. Um, what are your views on whether and how men and women need different reskilling and upskilling? And how can organizations ensure that reskilling programs for women are successful? 
So from a uh, from a uh, perspective of um, multitasking, right? W women do a very good job at it. So going back to this idea that everybody has less time, so the skilling piece has to be more impactful. So it needs to be in time. It needs to be relevant to their job, etc. So to me, I think the hard skills remain the same. Uh, what changes for uh, overall reskilling and specifically for women also is is the type of training that is happening. It needs to be more flexible. It needs to be more timely. Uh, it needs to be more hard hitting. This idea of let's get 30 people together in a class and teach them something. We have evolved from there. And I think we need to, you know, we need to move on from that uh, mindset. So more than the, uh, you know, the topics, et cetera, or the hard skills, I'd like to see uh, specifically for women and in general overall, I'd like to see the, the quality of delivery and the quality of engagement change. Thank you, uh, Nikhil, for that. Um, a few numbers that I just want to quote, and you know, uh, Kirti, my next question is going to be for you. Um, only 3.7% of CEOs and managing directors of NSE listed companies were women in 2019, a number that has increased just slightly from 3.2% in 2014, and only 8.9% of firms have women in top management positions. What do you think are the reasons for this and how can this be changed? That's um, such a big question, Serena. You're a woman and I'm sure you've heard this question multiple times and answered this question multiple times. So I'll be a little provocative here in my response. Um, when you look at those kind of numbers, uh, there's clearly what we in the IT industry call a leaky pipeline. Uh, and the parallel numbers that I'll give to you is that more than 50% of the new entrants in the IT industry are women. So they don't lack the STEM skills, they don't lack the coding knowledge, they pass all the interviews, they make it. So no problem in capability there. But once they get in, the drop-off begins to happen, whether it is after three years, seven years, 15 years. And you can just equate that to what's going on in the life, uh, life of a woman in, in, at those time periods. So what happens? I mean, why? Why is it that biology takes over? And it is biology that takes over. It is you are a woman, you are culturally expected to perform certain roles, be a certain way. So we can talk till the cows come home about those cultural problems that cause this leaky pipeline to happen. If you get transferred to Germany for a posting, how many times will your husband follow you or say, nay, nay, my career is more important. I need to be here or we don't want the children to go away. We need to, them to be brought up in India. I mean, this is just a silly example, but it's true, isn't it? I mean, this is what happens. How many supportive partners are there who will say, I'll follow you, you lead the path. How many women are there who stand up and say, that no, I think I'm doing a better job than you, so give me a chance. So there was this lovely TED talk I saw. I'd never heard of the lady, but you know, she said she said uh, she said some words which I thought were were really bang on on what I feel. She said that women need to speak up, need to speak out, and need to show up. Culturally, we are not trained to speak up. We don't speak our mind. We don't talk about something that's unfair. We just let it go because culturally, and now I'm going to come to why I never felt it. I never felt discriminated. And I have many friends who didn't feel that way. So when, you know, I come to a conversation like this saying, you know, what about women? I say, why didn't I feel it? And then I go back and try and look at the cultural aspects of it and say, I had parents who never held me back. I was always encouraged to speak up, speak out. Um, I was never put down for sharing an opinion. Uh, in my workplace, because I could speak up, my opinion was valued because I spoke up at the table and they said, oh, she's saying something sensible. As soon as you say something sensible, recognized you're your place at the table. So there's the things that we have to do to help ourselves because to say that we will change our cultural milieu and suddenly start you know, telling all the fathers of all the betis that you have to now treat them all differently ain't gonna happen in a hurry. But what can happen in a hurry is something we can do ourselves. And uh, Nikhil was talking about you know, training differently for women. 
And that's, I think, something that we can do for women. It's not about what you teach them. It's not the hard skills at all. It's teach them to speak up. And when you say show up, it is about be there for each other. So if someone of your kind and these problems, we are not alone. No woman is alone. All these problems are this leaky pipeline affects everybody. It is, it's, not, it's not a surprise that your data is what it is, that the numbers have hardly changed over the last 10 years. This is because you, you're fighting against culture and you, we all know culture eats strategy for breakfast. So how do you fight that? You can't, you have to fight it yourself and you can. And I think there are enough women and I, know, I don't know you, but I just the way you're speaking, what you're doing, I can bet that you did it for yourself as well. So if you can do it, can we inspire three other women to do it with us? Can we coach them? Can we partner them? Can we be there for them? So how many times are women there for women? I think that's something we can do immediately. So there's a long term, there's a short term. In, and I think we're talking the short term because women are equally qualified. They're brilliant. I'm brilliant. You're brilliant. So why should we, why should we fade away into the sunset and go and have to look after the children because somebody else will not? Or, or the in-laws or the parents or do the hospital visits, whatever it is, or be there for the family functions where the husband doesn't even go to office but goes to play golf. So why? Why do we have to accept it? Because we've been taught to. So my big one formula is find the right partner. In the short term, <laughs> that's what you got to do. Find the right partner. He's going to have your back and nothing will hold you back after that. So, you know, the golf part resonated a lot with me. And I could also see that resonating with uh, Nikhil and Nishche. So maybe yeah, I, don't, I, share I don't play golf. I don't play golf. Right off the bat, I don't play golf. <laughs> what about you, Nishche? I'm uh, working these days. <laughs> uh, yeah. Any views from either one of you? Uh, I mean, I'd love to uh, add to what Keithi said, but from Nikhil or Nishani. Well, I think, think you're you spot on, right? I think, uh, look, no, and, and this is a, you know, I'm going to sound like a cliche, unfortunately. Nobody's going to do it for you. You've got to step up and sort of, can the system be better? Can it support it better? Can we do 20 things to, uh, to make, the, uh, in terms of going back to the career, et cetera? Uh, absolutely, yes. And I think we are a long way off from where we should be. Uh, but there is a reason why, uh, you know, Kirti and Serena, you, you guys have, you know, uh, made it here, et cetera. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why uh, people are, haven't. So I think it, it starts, uh, starts from within for sure. But having said that, I think we can do, and I think Kirti alluded to it also, we can do a lot from a system perspective, from a process perspective, from a regulator perspective. I think a lot of times we, um, we sort of, um, we say the words, but we don't actually do anything about it. Uh, and I think the everything from a regulator to uh, I have seen, uh, you know, there are examples of companies who have done a great job of doing this, right? Of bringing back women from their midlife careers, etc. And there's a concerted effort to do this. Unless you put concerted effort from an organization perspective to do this, it's not going to happen. And the only way you're going to put concerted effort is if you value. Uh, women, uh, uh, sort of a diverse, diverse sort of workforce, and what it brings to your organization, to the bottom line, what it brings to the culture of your organization. That's the only way to get it done. I think this idea that I want, you know, equal women participation. I think the the question we should ask ourselves: Why do we want it? And I think we should we should sort of brand in in the sense we should talk about cases where companies have been able to do that and create much better companies in terms of profit, in terms of culture, in terms of impact. All that. So there's, there's one thing that's just happened recently, which again is a short term thing. I mean, I'm thinking short term because as I said, you know, long term, a lot of things have to change. The new OSP guidelines that have come, this is, uh, I don't, you know, I don't know if you're aware, but the, the uh, IT ministry has just changed some regulations, which allows for a whole lot of flexibility and work from home, work from anywhere, so to speak. And the one big thing that I think we are going to see is, a, is an increase in participation of women because those cultural things that are holding them back and not allowing them to come you know, physically to the workplace or travel or somewhere, this will help them to be there, be present and yet manage whatever they're expected to manage. So we're very, very positive at NASCOM about this, uh, the impact that this regulation is going to have 
on women in particular, and of course, uh, people with you know special needs or people with disabilities. I mean, this is going to be really, really game changing. And um, Kirti, you know, just to share a couple of my thoughts on this, um, and you're right, this is a question that has been asked zillions of times to lots of people, men, women, probably also fathers, brothers, mothers, everyone, and, and you're right. Um, the combination of the reason of society and how, you know, we've been conditioned in the past so many centuries about the role of women is a very key one. Uh, but also, I would like to focus on the fact that we individually as women, as you correctly said, do not one, clarify in our own heads what we want, then articulating it to the people who impact our lives and who matter to us. And thirdly, the most important I feel, asking for help and support when it is needed. Yes. You know, this whole superwoman, I think is very, very sadly, misused, abused, over abused. Um, and the fact that, you know, um, you want to keep balancing everything. And, you know, I always say that, you know, again, balance is a very overrated word. At different stages of your life, you need to prioritize and focus on different things. And that is what your balance is. So when I started working for the first about 12 to 15 years, my work life balance was only work work balance. And that's what made me very happy. And after that, there were various other elements that came on to play and I was very happy with that. And, you know, again, some of us are absolutely fortunate to be part of families and certain society uh, sections or organizations. And I, I've been very fortunate with that, that we've always got the support to do what we wanted to do. But having said that, I think just to have articulated and announced it to the people around us as to what I want to do was a very, very key first step. And I'm absolutely sure, and I say this with a lot of confidence, I hope uh, it'll absolutely play out this way, is that Vacademy is going to be able to give women that kind of support and those kind of practical tools to be able to pave this way ahead for them. So fingers crossed, and I'm hoping that we will have a discussion exactly like this, maybe uh, one year from now, let's, let's put that, which is talking about how the needle is moving or is going to move. Oh, in India, in India, actually, we have women in power. I mean, Kamala Harris became vice president. The whole U.S. is going crazy that I have a vice president as a woman. We have prime ministers, presidents. I mean, you name it. We have women all over the place. We worship them, for God's sake. I mean, all the Kalis and the Durgas and the Shaktis. I mean, this is us. So, actually, we have the foundation. We just, if we just get out there and help ourselves, I think things can be a lot better. Absolutely. Which brings me to a, a more, uh, you know, future-oriented question. And uh, Nisha, maybe I can start with you, but would love to get views from both uh, Nikhil and Kirti after that. Um, Nisha, in your view, what are the top three to five skills of the future that women professionals need to have? Now, um, interesting, because there isn't a distinction between men and women, at least in my view in terms of the skills that they need to acquire and future proof themselves. Because gender differences in skills are rooted in gender differences in occupations actually. And we've seen that women by and large uh, are in occupations concentrated in broad categories of administrative support, medical healthcare, managerial and educational related occupations where men are more concentrated in production and mechanical skills. Uh, and equally so, I think the studies of brain structure and function, hormonal modulation of performance of hum human, human cognitive development and of human evolution have not revealed significant biological differences between men and women performing science and mathematics that can be that can actually account for lower representation in STEM. Now, having said that, with all the technology at play and societal conditions that we are bound by and, and cultural traditions, uh, clearly so what's happening is that, uh, you know, the future of jobs is a hybrid, where really there are three types of skills or categories of skills that I'd like to call out. One, social, second fundamental and third analytical 
And it is a combination of these skill sets that must come together to, to actually future proof whether men or women. Uh, some of these skills are, for example, cloud computation, data, uh, data analytics, AI, uh, content development. These are some of the skills that I do believe uh, will play, will cut across industries in terms of jobs and will also create new jobs that uh, people can then aspire to, to, um, to occupy. Your views, please, on this one. Sir, your name was that me. I was either one of you, Nikhil or Kirti. So let me let me quickly comment, and I'll let Kirti go then. So I personally feel that we are in the age of specialization, right? So everybody needs to know one specific particular job well, and they have to do that extremely well, and sort of you know specialize over years, etc. I, you know, I've been on teams, boards, etc. where I've seen representation when, when there is equal representation from women, those boards and teams perform better. And this is anecdotal and actually it's, there's, there's enough evidence around it also. I personally think there is a whole bunch of, because I completely agree with Nisha, the hard skills, etc. cloud computing for women is no different from men. I think this entire, the soft skills piece of it, which is, you know, the concentration of EQ, the concentration on multitask. I personally believe that women just because of what they go through to get where they are, you know, what the domestic life that Kirti talked a little bit about, etc. They are more suited towards this thing and we should enhance those type of skills. So, for example, I have seen startup boards where women are able to connect with the founder a lot more better and get actually more work out of them in a more meaningful manner rather than going sort of more prescriptive, I think. So I think in terms of, I don't actually have future skills for you, but I do have the comment to say that there are some skills that women naturally have and they should be honed on over the years etc that and they should actively work on that particular skill and specifically work on that period that Kirti talked a little bit about is when they are out of action or for for a lack of a better word when they're missing uh, in that one two three years etc in, in mid-career i think these are the type of skills that uh, you know that can be worked upon through through intervention through training to actually self-realization a little bit saying that look this is important and this is what is going to get me back into the workforce well, Kirti? so I, I i i agree with nikhil and Nisha. i mean i mean firstly that i don't think the hard skills need to be different for men or women uh, the soft skills, what Nikhil talked about, actually is the reason why the data says that diversified teams perform better because they do have, women do bring that, that listening, they bring that empathy, they bring that, I think that talent for multitasking because they're problem solving all the time. I mean, the fact that you're always juggling balls in the air is, it, it does help. I mean, there is a conditioning that you have to do that. So those are all the good things that they do have. But I think what they need, what women really need support on and really need to be taught to do is on how to express yourself. So in this, in this um, cultural uh, background um, of saying, of not wanting to contradict or not wanting to be assertive, ki ye to bahut jada, you know, she speaks too much or she's too aggressive. I mean, you speak out, you're being labeled aggressive. And I've been a victim of that. Uh, such is life. It's okay. I have no regrets at all. Uh, but I, I, but I think I have met women who have worked with me who I have needed to teach them that you must express yourself. You must speak out in meetings. This is how you present yourself, your point of view. This is how you don't you don't uh, project your uh, limitations because if you project your limitations in an organization they will start thinking of you as a person with limitations. And then you wonder why you get passed over, you don't get asked for the challenging projects because you've already said, nay, I won't be able to do this and I won't be able to do that. So if you're gonna do it, be conscious that you're doing it, be aware. But this consciousness and awareness is not easy. Somebody has to hold that mirror up to you and tell you that this is happening. So to me, whether it's something like coaching or whether it's assertive communication or whether it's uh, just effective communication, uh, persuasion, negotiation. I think they need to be taught negotiation because the hard skills, no difference at all. 
the soft skills, you probably have it, but you don't know how to use it. So that's what I would focus on in something like a vocabulary, which is focusing on women, where you're looking at mid-career, where women have to be particularly persuasive because they're actually competing with men who didn't have that break. And now you're coming back or didn't have that step back or whatever the reason uh, that they need that help. So they particularly need that. You know, you've actually answered a part of my uh, next question, which really is that, you know, when we're talking about all these interventions in the early or the mid career of various, you know, women in all these industries, what is the learning and development support that we can give? And, you know, I think, as I said, I think that's, that's almost partly answered. Um, and I would like to, again, you know, um, agree with you completely, Keerthi, with the fact that coaching and mentoring become very, very key parts of uh, helping groom women to be able to clarify in their head at times what they want, because, you know, when you're multitasking, there's also so much happening in your brain that, you know, it, it, it gets pulled in so many different directions. So how to get that clarity of thought. And then with the confidence that you want to move ahead, articulating it, communicating it, expressing it. And, you know, again, I keep going back to this point of asking for certain things, ask for it. You know, if you don't ask, the answer is always no. So even if the probability of a yes is increasing by 1%, it's worth it, you know, as a, as a pure mathematical number. Uh, but any, anything else that any of you would like to add in terms of uh, any, uh, any other interventions you feel that we could do uh, organizations could do in terms of learning and development for women in early to mid careers? So there are a couple of things I would add. Uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate the point Kirti makes on, you know, step up, step forward, you know, take the initiative. But a lot of that has to do with the environment and the support system around you and in, in the organization construct. And equally so the sponsorship or the active participation more like it by men, um, you know, no DNI program has been successful, which hasn't actually had the active involvement and participation of men equally. So in that program, uh, that's one, two, uh, I do believe that there is a larger problem. And I think Nicola alluded to it in terms of throughput, which is actually about the gender parity index in, in the way our education system operates today, whether enough women and female candidates actually have access to good quality education and more so now because uh, clearly you need to access that uh, quality education through, through some means of technology, which is either a computer or a mobile phone. And we do know that there is a problem in terms of penetration of technology, especially when it comes to the urban rural divide. So the throughput, that's one area I think we must focus our efforts on. And while there have been, I guess, developments and, and, and there has been progress, you know, with government initiatives such as Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao, Yojana, that was one which actually improved the gender parity index. Uh, clearly, there, there is a need for this uh, coalition between the government, between industry, between academia, between the NGOs, uh, between associations, all coming together to actually drive a longer term program. And one of my interest is to you know, try and solve the shorter term needs. I do, I do believe that would be a band-aid approach and it withers away. You need systemic interventions that can actually support A, the induction of women into the workforce, B, then obviously ensuring that they progress. Um, and, and we've seen through the data, right? There are enough women candidates as you reach the manager level, they kind of taper off. And the reason for that could be many. It could be an unconscious bias, glass ceiling within the organization. But as an LND practitioner, I, I guess you have to sensitize and create a support system within the organization where there is access to good quality uh, learning and content. There is equal sensitization of progression within the organization. I'm not necessarily being divisive that you know two candidates are if one candidate is more worthy than be it, uh, be it male or female, at least my perspective is merit should always be the focus. But opportunity, I mean, the opportunity itself, whether it's a hiring bias, whether it's a promotion bias, and we know what Posh did, right? For, for the longest period, what Posh did was it actually 
made men even more wary of hiring women in 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 their teams because there were a number of cases that we were aware of that perhaps were just out of out of uh, you know being vindictive and we don't want that scenario and i'm not taking away from the merits of posh but equally so i think as we address women in tech this is equally about men participating in women in tech that's the only point i make you know again very very valid uh, anishay uh, the fact also is that um, you know within organizations um, these are things that do exist and you know we've all seen them in some manner experienced them in in another way um, but the systemic solution has somewhere not made the kind of impact that we would ideally want it to and and that's where you know i think it becomes important and you know while we speak about women and when they enter this industry or you know they're part of organizations early um, mid career etc um you know um would love to hear your thoughts nikhil on on another aspect which is really returnee women now in the indian context as i understand 48% of indian women quit their jobs due to family commitments and or as we said biological reasons a lot of these women want to come back right and there are lots of challenges that that happen uh, you know in their lives so what is your uh, you know um, view you know as a male ally if i may call you that uh, in terms of the challenges that they should prioritize work through and what suggestions if at all that you would like to give them so <clears throat> i'll start with from what challenges do they do they uh, uh, do they need to work through because that's a long long list etc and you don't have the time uh but i will give out uh one suggestion one particular suggestion which uh i have seen time and again uh, and i have given this advice before also is to have a plan when they leave most women when you ask them what's the plan they have this they can give you uh right which i find uh you know dangerous because if you don't have a plan on the day you were looking to you know leave and come back etc i think very fraction of them are able to actually uh, articulate and work through a plan a comeback plan from the day that they have decided to you know stop working or work with their jobs etc and i think time and again when you have had that plan when you, when people have had that on the top of their head etc uh, there's a high probability of the, that workforce coming back or that women folk coming back to the workforce so this idea that dekhenge we'll figure it out time will pass and we'll will this my view it doesn't work and i think this um, you know in spite of the organization you've seen women come back succeed at it etc and i think that is the differentiating factor where people have had a plan have people to say look what am i going to do during this and it's hard don't get me wrong i i get it it's it's super hard but i think having that plan articulating it making sure that your stakeholders various stakeholders are aware of that particular plan expectations are set from the beginning and you're working through that plan over a period of time i think is is the only sort of i guess suggestion that i have or, or advice that i have from i'll add a couple of things here uh, one absolutely have a plan which essentially means again it has to talk to organization policy you know whether there is a sabbatical or an extended maternity leave if that's the reason you're you're planning to quit the organization but even during that period or even if it's an extended period one always remain connected to your network cuz you know you, you can't go into oblivion during that period uh, two i guess the context is also dramatically shifted right because you can now work from home uh, and many organizations in fact are promoting that and i don't think it's going to move you know move back to the old normal uh, so clearly you have an option to continue pursuing your career while you're kind of juggling different balls while you're at home equally so and if you're planning to extend that period you know, where you're not planning to you know return full time equally so now there are gig work you know you can become a gig worker because there are many options where you can actually work part time if your organization isn't the right destination you could you could follow through with another one and use your time here to continuously upskill yourselves because the world is changing by the day so you know if i've retired or taken off from my from my work 10 years i mean the world has moved in these 10 years and then trying to make a comeback is very difficult because you've you haven't kept up 
um, and invested in yourself like anybody else is expected to do. So there is empathy for you know juggling different balls, but equally so there has to be ownership to ensure that yes, you're a meritorious candidate and you've made the investment in yourself to ensure that you can be a worthy returnee to the workforce in any organization. So that's when, you know, if I were to add to the plan uh, component, those are the components that you can actually thoughtfully now put in place as you look at uh, making a comeback to the workforce. Sure, and you know, one of the provocative questions that I would put up to the women that I coach or mentor is that why do you really need to juggle so many balls? Why don't you look at really prioritizing and understanding what is it that is creating the value, making you happier, is, is needed at that phase of your life and don't juggle as many balls. And you know, that, that, that of course raises a lot of eyebrows and a lot of questions, but why not? You know, um, we, we are uh, meant to live our lives. Uh, no point thinking about it. Sorry, after no, I think you took Kirti's line away. Sorry, Nikhil, say that again. Serena, I think you took Kirti's line away. <laughs> <laughs> I possibly did. And, uh, you know, I think that's been a very, very, um, very, very intense discussion, if I may call it that, with, uh, with so many uh, practical and good ideas. Uh, but just in the interest of time, may I invite just closing comments from all of you and uh, we'll bring it to a close. So if I could start with you, Kirti. So I think I just want to sum up what Nikhil and Nishche said and say, have a plan have a story because when you come back and you've just shown that you did nothing in the time that you were away, there is no reason why anyone should hire you and rightly so. Um, and men are not bad. I don't think organizations or men are sitting out there and saying, I want to discriminate against women. They're not doing that. So, um, so ask, I think you said that, what have you got to lose by asking? And the, the may the best person win, you know, whether man or woman, merit must call, must, must rule the day. So, but if you don't show, show what you have, nobody knows it. So I think that would be my, uh, my parting comment that uh, help yourself showcase what you have and nobody sitting out there to say, no, I don't want to give you that opportunity intentionally and saying, I want to keep the women, uh, women back. So I think the world is a good place. We can take advantage of that. I would absolutely agree with that. And thank you, Kirti Seit, very much. Uh, Nikhil? Look, I, th I think we need to, uh, all of us, uh, you know, your, uh, Serena, your organization, your new academy, et cetera, uh, ed tech firms, uh, corporates, et cetera, need to do a better job in, uh, in, uh, in uh, figuring out or in actually uh, creating uh, awareness about the importance of balanced teams, uh, creating the value that women come uh, bring to to the team, etc. Because I think uh, if we don't see value in in that, and if we are unable to communicate that, then no amount of conversation, uh, no amount of that is going to change anything. I think systematic policy, uh, firm culture, organization policies will start from. You know what adds value to the bottom line what adds uh, value to the profitability and what uh, adds value to long-term sustainable impact and i think it does and i really think we should do a better job all of us should do a better job of branding the importance of women in, in teams and in the workforce thank you nikhil that sounds very very promising nishe over to you yeah I'd say, you know, the, I caution against stereotyping. You know, I've just, uh, I always believe that, you know, we should take individuals on, on and cases on their merit rather than, you know, painting with a brush and the canvas looks exactly the same to everyone. Uh, equally so, I think this is about individual choices. So, I, you know, I, I do believe that there, there could be and probably are equal number of women that uh, that find joy and value in bringing up their kids and and spending time at home and looking after their in-laws and looking after their husbands and equally so there could be husbands that are you know uh, stay home dads and uh, look after the kids so clearly so i think that those are all very individual choices and we shouldn't uh, steer everyone in the same direction 
And that's what coaching and mentoring is about, finding joy. So happy learning for everyone. Super, with that, thank you very much uh, for being part of this session. And uh, I'm sure we're all excited about the Academy launch. Um, and with that, I would like to sign off. Hope to see you all in person in better days when we can actually have a drink, have a coffee and say cheers. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. A big thank you to all our elite panelists for getting us introduced to Academy. Thank you, Mr. Suri, Kriti, and Mr. Barishikar. And of course, Ms. Serena Singh for moderating this beautiful session.